I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you the latest military and diplomatic updates from Ukraine and around the world. And we analyze the history and changing role of women in Ukraine's armed forces on International Women's Day 2024. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Friday, the 8th of March, 2024, two years and 13 days since the full-scale invasion began. Today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley, spectator journalist, Svetlana Moronets, and BBC journalist, Olga Malchevska. Just a note to our listeners, today's episode contains graphic descriptions of violence against women. I started by asking Dom for the latest updates from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. So a wave of Russian missile and drone attacks in the last 24 hours uh, has left dead and injured across the country. There were multiple rocket strikes in Kupiansk, so that's about 50 k's southeast of Kharkiv, up in the, the northeast of the country. That comes from Ole uh, Sibinov, who we've spoke, spoken of before, the Kharkiv governor. He reported that, and he said that early this morning, S-300 missiles also hit Cherchiv. That's just to the east of Kharkiv city itself. That comes on top of strikes on Cherchiv late yesterday. Then in nearby or neighbouring Sumy Oblast, missile strikes damaged a school and the central city hospital, the local governor reported. That blast being just one of 32 strikes yesterday in the region came from the uh, military administration up there. Ukraine shot down 33 of 37 drones overnight, 18 Shahid drones over Odessa, coming from the Ukrainian armed forces. Only keeper, Odessa's regional governor, said an infrastructure facility in the region was damaged, but there were no immediate reports of casualties. Drones also downed over central and eastern regions, that last coming from Ukraine's air force. Now, let's go back up to Kupiansk, so 50 k's ish east of Kharkiv, and Ukraine has announced the mandatory evacuation of uh, children amid the the intense Russian bombardment I've just uh, been talking about. All residents, including over a 1,000 children, are being, well, I think made, I don't know if they get much choice in this, invited slash forced to leave 57 settlements in the region owing to the danger from the constant attacks. That also came from Ole Sibonov, who's the regional governor, as I said. Meanwhile, uh, in sticking in the neighbourhood, all children, along with their parents, will be evacuated from 18 villages in the Veliko Bolutska and Vilkivatska communities. They are, that's to the northeast and the southwest of Kharkiv city. There's thought to be nearly 200 children uh, in that uh, in that group. Now, Mr. Sibonov said that these residents will be relocated within Kharkiv and other regions of Ukraine where accommodation has already been prepared for them. Uh, and just, uh, just to bring us up to date, that takes up to more than 28,000 people that have had to be evacuated from Kharkiv since the beginning of this year. That's reported by Ukrainska Pravda. Now, elsewhere, 28 children to be evacuated from Donetsk, the Ministry of Reintegration, report that last one. Elsewhere, explosions were reported in the Russian-occupied cities of Tokmak and Melitopol. That's down the south in Zaporizhia Oblast. Governor Ivan Fedorov reporting there. Now, you might remember Ukraine's military intelligence agency said in January this year that partisans had blown up a vehicle with four Russian soldiers in Melitopol. There have been other attacks in the region put down to either partisans or Ukrainian special forces, we're not entirely sure. No reports yet of the uh, the effect of those explosions. Now, elsewhere, Czech President Petro Pavel, he said yesterday that enough money has been found to buy the 800,000 artillery shells, well, the munitions identified for Ukraine. You may remember Prague launched its uh, military aid initiative in February on the kind of artillery side, looking at the open market. It said it had identified half a million 155 mil artillery rounds and 300,000 122 mil rockets available on the open market outside of Europe that could be bought and sent to Ukraine. 
Now, Czech media outlet CT24, they reported President Pavel as saying that 18 countries have now joined this initiative, stumped up the cash, and the Ukraine would be getting that ammunition, quote, within weeks. The Kiev Independent said Norway was the last country to join this particular grouping. They have allocated 1.6 billion Norwegian kroner, that's um, just over 150 million uh, US dollars, into that pot. Other contributors, including um, the Netherlands, Belgium, Germany, Latvia, Canada, they've already publicly committed to the initiative and put their hands in the pockets. Uh, Petra Pavel said, now everything will depend on our, on the companies and the defence ministry's abilities to speed up the whole process of delivering the aid. So an interesting little, there's these little groups, one of which I'll speak about in, in a moment. So kind of under, underneath the Ramstein umbrella, the kind of US, the Ukraine defence contact group, the US initiative started at air base in Germany, Ramstein air base, the 50 plus countries all supplying military aid. There are other groups that are supporting particular initiatives, i.e. one pot of just money to go to the open market. This other group we've just spoken about there looking for um, artillery and and other sort of um, missiles. And then the next one, drones. Speaking of drones, British Defence Secretary Grant Shapps is in Kyiv. Well, he was there yesterday. I don't know if he's left yet. He announced a further £125 million uh, investment into drones. That brings the UK drone program for Ukraine up to 325 million because Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announced a a 200 mil package in January. So 325 million quid, not bad. Uh, MOD here says that will deliver more than 10,000 drones, a good number across the whole piece. So they say it's going to be, well, the first person view drones as well as uh, intelligence and uh, what they're calling one way, one way attack drones, i.e. You can't really, well, you don't, you can't bring them back. It's find a target or pile it into somewhere safe. So a good number and a good mix of capabilities. I just note the last time we had any real credible figures on this, uh, the, from the height of fighting last summer, Ukraine was going through 10,000 drones in a month. Now that was, they were very, thought to be of the lower quality, as in just being able to drop they were dropping uh, mortars and grenades and what have you. So the very low end of the remote controlled world, which is a lot of what this stuff is. So I'm not suggesting all these drones are in that. But I question, I just wonder how long 10,000 drones will last at the height of fighting, but it's going in the right direction. So that package, as I say, mainly com- containing first person view drones, but um, surveillance and maritime drones and over a thousand one way attack drones, as they described, that have been developed in the UK, Canada has pledged to join this group as well as well sorry it's the uk latvia coalition here this bit of of capabilities uh, run out of uk and latvia canada's joined uh, joined that little group now mr shaps uh, he said that more than 100 million quid from the from this package will be spent on ukraine's maritime capabilities he said rather clunkily he said it's going to continue to turn the tide in the black sea so okay fine and then shaps put out a interestingly put out a little a little film today just in the last hour that uh, it was from st michael square in kiev we did something very similar actually a couple of weeks ago when we were there jack jack videoed me going around the destroyed russian equipment in the square talking about what each of them or what each of the vehicles were so shaps was wandering around a bmp2 obviously you know, 30 mil cannon and we know all that side firing ports etc he said i'm in kiev to raise the alarm to the democratic world we must make sure ukraine wins this war which i thought was interesting first time You've heard people talking about winning the war, not just the usual do what it takes, stick with you for as long as necessary, blah, blah, blah. So talk about winning the war. That's good. Now we'll just say, OK, define winning the war. He said the UK has stepped up to do more than ever with our largest military support package to date. Every nation must now do the same and ensure freedom triumphs over tyranny. Uh, so good. However, in response to that tweet, you may already have seen it. Um, the bearded wonder Joe Barnes did reply to him and said, uh, yeah, a wake up call to the world over the dangers of letting Putin win in Ukraine. Yet as a percentage of GDP, Britain contributes less to Kiev than France, Germany, the Netherlands, Estonia, Denmark and many others. So, yeah, good and good for Joe for uh, holding his feet to the fire there. We will continue to do so. And then finally for me, David, India has busted what they're describing as a major human trafficking network which lured young men to Russia with the promise of jobs only to see them forced into military service, some fighting and dying in Ukraine. This comes from India's uh, crime agency. 
So about 35 people have been sent to Russia in the scheme so far, according to the Central Bureau of Investigation. And they said at least two men who went to Russia expecting to work as helpers in the army have been killed while fighting at the front. That came from their families. The Indian embassy in Russia confirmed one of those deaths. The CBI, so this India's crime agency, said in a statement that traffickers operating across several Indian states targeted people using social media platforms and through local agents. In a statement, they said the trafficked Indian nationals were trained in combat roles and deployed at front bases in Russia, Ukraine war zone against their wishes. They added that some others had been grievously injured. Now, the CBI said it was conducting searches at several locations, including in the capital, New Delhi and financial hub, Mumbai, and that 50 million rupees, that's about 470,000 pounds, 600,000 ish US dollars, had already been seized along with documents and electronic records. The Indian Foreign Ministry said that every case of Indians being duped into fighting in the war had been strongly taken up with Moscow, but the Russian Foreign Ministry has, has yet to respond. And I'll take a pause there, David. Well, thank you very much for all of that, Tom. Francis Sternley, before we go to Svetlana and Olga, what's been across your desk this morning? Well, thanks, David. America will not walk away from Ukraine. So claimed a defiant Joe Biden in his State of the Union address last night, urging Congress to approve stalled military aid to Kiev. Strong words. Putin is on the march, he said, invading Ukraine and sowing chaos throughout Europe and beyond. If anybody in this room thinks Putin will stop at Ukraine, I assure you he will not. My message to Putin, who I've known for a long time, is simple. We will not walk away. Now, that may be so in the case of the Democrats, but the exact nature of their support remains under deep scrutiny, particularly on the weapons issue. And the uncomfortable truth from the Ukrainian perspective is that Biden can say what he likes. Now that Donald Trump has effectively secured the nomination, Russia knows that the strategic advantage of their dragging the conflict out is that they may gain the ultimate prize, namely an American president willing to sell out Kiev. As we've reported, Europe is waking up to the danger of an American withdrawal of support, whether a partial or total withdrawal, with French President Emmanuel Macron doubling down last night on his argument that the West may have to step in to save Ukraine if Russia makes a breakthrough on the Eastern Front. We learn Macron went as far as inviting opposition leaders to the Elysee Palace last night, showing them maps of potential Russian breakthroughs towards Odessa or Kiev, telling them there should be no more red lines on France's involvement in the conflict. These are maps of the Ukrainian front that are freely available anywhere, an Elysee spokesman told The Telegraph when we asked more about those maps. Speaking after the two and a half hour meeting, the party chiefs who he spoke to said that the talks with Macron had left them concerned, with some accusing him of seeking to exploit the conflict for domestic gain ahead of key European elections in June. But it came as Lord Cameron said Europe must rein in wars in Ukraine and Gaza before the US president is sworn in November. So David Cameron, British Foreign Secretary, was speaking at a Berlin press conference along the German Foreign Secretary and said the crises needed to be solved and in the best possible place by the time of the next presidential election. So I think it's important to understand the context here in which Macron is speaking. Time is feeling very much of the essence for European leaders at the moment. Listeners will recall that it was only last week Macron was causing considerable disquiet among many in Europe by refusing to rule out sending Western ground troops to Ukraine, pointing to Russia's hardening stance. He urged Ukraine's allies not to be cowards in supporting the country's fight against the Russian invasion. Yesterday, some party leaders said Macron was advocating now for a no-limits approach to counter Putin as part of his theory of strategic ambivalence, keeping Moscow guessing, in other words. If so, many will argue it is welcome that the West may well be trying to claw back some of that strategic initiative it has conceded to Moscow. 
But if so, it will need a concerted effort with Berlin and London not immediately shooting down such ideas, which indeed may well, as Macron says, be necessary. After all, consider just this as a hypothetical. If Russia were to make military breakthroughs threatening, say, Kyiv, is it really conceivable at this stage that the West could permit that? I would argue that a line has already been crossed that would make that impossible. So logically, logically, Macron is right. The question, therefore, has to be now, to Dom's point, defining what the red lines are, if we accept that they exist. Now, in response to this threat, France is planning to have some of its arms manufacturers start producing military equipment directly on Ukrainian soil this summer, another notable intervention. Indeed, public recognition of Western troops and arm manufacturers already on the ground may be the first step for Macron to achieve his objective of making future deployments not seem a radical step, but the next logical step. And more news, of course, good news for Kyiv comes in that context of what Dom has already reported on in the form of European allies finally banding together the money needed to purchase those 800,000 artillery shells. The Czechs have been strong allies since the start, and they now go further as well, further to the announcement we've just been talking about, with the government suspending meetings with Slovakia in the coming months amid concerns Bratislava is shifting away from supporting Kyiv. We consider the meeting between the Slovak foreign minister and the Russian foreign minister to be problematic, the Czech Prime Minister said. The government therefore does not believe it is appropriate to hold intergovernmental consultations with the government of the Slovak Republic at this time. Quite interesting that, I think. In other news, just to conclude, a remarkable development last night with Kyiv naming the former head of the army, General Valery Zaluzhny, as its new ambassador to Britain. Kyiv's foreign ministry announced Zelensky had signed off on that diplomatic appointment, though no time for his arrival in London has yet been announced. It speaks to the importance of London as a key broker on weapons support to Kyiv. No man will know more what precisely is needed than Zaluzhny, as well as it coming with the political advantage for Zelensky of having Zaluzhny out of the way and not being a lightning rod for Zelensky's detractors to rally around in Ukraine. It's quite a coup, I think, for London to have him coming here, mending some of the damage of Kyiv not having a formal ambassador appointed for many months now. Suffice to say, we hope to interview him as soon as he arrives and settles in, but no yet estimate exactly when that will be. But nonetheless, David, a very, very interesting development indeed, with significant ramifications, I would say. Coming up, we speak to Spectator journalist Svetlana Moronets and BBC journalist Olga Malchevska about the changing role of women in Ukraine's armed forces. Well, thank you very much, Dom and Francis, for your reporting and thoughts there. Now, to discuss the role of women in the Ukrainian armed forces, the obstacles and challenges they face, and their future as the war continues, we're joined by spectator journalist Svetlana Moronets and the BBC's Olga Maschevska. Um, thank you so much, Svetlana and Olga, for joining us. Um, Svetlana, can I start with you? Could you just sketch out, um, in broad terms, some of the details of, of women in the, in the AFU? Um, how many are fighting? Where are they fighting? What do we know? Thank you, David. Of course. Uh, This year, the total number of women in the Ukrainian armed forces, not only military personnel, has reached 62,000. Out of them, over 45,000 are military personnel. For comparison, 10 years ago, this figure was about three times smaller. And at least 4,000 women are at the front line at this moment performing, performing combat tasks. Previously, women in the Ukrainian army could take only non-combat positions like telephone operators, cooks, doctors, accountants, clerks. The big change happened after Russia invaded Donbass in 2014, when women went to fight uh, for the first time in volunteer battalions. They volunteered. And 
Uh, back then, no, nobody paid attention to bureaucratic procedures. And in addition, Russian full-scale invasion two years ago and the need to mobilize more people led Ukrainian society to perceive women as potential soldiers. And now women are able to legally occupy combat positions and fight as snipers, tankers, become assault soldiers, drivers, and so on. Uh, Ukrainian society has long ceased to perceive a woman in the army as an anomaly, but the women themselves still face some issues and even sexism at the front line. Well, thank you very much, Svetlana, for that overview. When we talk about the sexism female soldiers face then, Olga, do you want to pick that up there? What kind of issues are we talking about? What have we seen over the past two years? Hello, and thank you very much for having me. Well, that's exactly something I've covered in my BBC documentary, Ukraine Women at War. And as Svetlana mentioned, There are over 62,000 women currently serving in the Ukrainian armed forces. According to the latest data we've got, there are at least 5,000 women on the front line. And I interviewed some of those women who have been serving as snipers and a special service unit surgeons. Well, sexism is quite a painful topic for the army in the transition countries. Ukraine, let's put it that way. If you think back about the Soviet Union times where, you know, and Ukraine, which got independence after that in 1991, trying to build their own army, obviously become closer to Europe as close as possible. And obviously that gap between the Soviet Union army and Russian army and Ukrainian army was growing, luckily, in in favor to the democratic values. But still, women who I've been talking to reported lots of issues in terms of sexism. Let's say, I'll just give you some examples which those women told me about. One of our main characters, Andriana Rekta, who is a special service unit sergeant, she said that when she had joined the Ukrainian armed forces back in 2014, she had to join as a seamstress. So officially her position was a seamstress, although she was doing sniper activities and obviously she was sewing in line with all other soldiers. She didn't have any preferences. She had been doing the same kind of jobs as men were, risking her life the same way, but officially she was a seamstress. So you can imagine that she was paid as well the same way as a seamstress. She was not paid as a soldier, even if you think just about that aspect. And in terms of the treatment, she also described a couple of cases, like in the very beginning, obviously there were lots of jokes. People were asking her whether she was a wife of a commander or she was a cook. People couldn't really believe that she was a soldier. But obviously those who knew her more who knew her better they really respected and appreciated and then she had to really fight for her reputation and then 10 years later she has become a special service unit surgeon officially and um, before that it was a huge huge way really and she had launched she was wounded many times she was injured when we were recording her she was in a military hospital recovering from a very dramatic injury really luckily she stayed alive and she also launched a veteran movement called uh, Veteranka to support other Ukrainian female soldiers and due to her efforts and the efforts of other female soldiers they managed to really conduct a reform in the Ukrainian armed forces which led to the official recognition of women on the front line and in those positions. And I just wanted to mention here that all women I've been speaking to, they they didn't join the army because they really wanted to fight. So from what I've heard from all of them, it was an it was a pain. It was a very painful decision for all of them, which was made because as they told me, they just couldn't bear watching their loved ones go into the front line, being injured there, dying there, and just not doing anything. And so they joined. And that's how Andriana joined. That's how other women joined. And our main character, again, Andriana, she has a child. And it was probably the most painful decision for her because, according to her words, she couldn't really imagine her son 
joining the armed forces later on. So that's why she joined, because she didn't want her son to grow in the environment of war and to face that necessity to join the front line when his age reaches that line. Thank you so much, Olga Svetlana. Can I come back to you? Um, Olga there mentioned some of the issues and obstacles faced by uh, female soldiers in the Ukrainian armed forces in the in the past few years, since 2014. What do we know about some of the challenges at the moment? One of the challenges is producing military uniform for women. It's been a long-standing problem. Traditionally, women's uniform in the Ukrainian army were provided only for formal wear, like skirts with uh, high-heeled shoes. Women in the Ukrainian army didn't have field female military uniforms. They were issued men's sets from underwear, oversized shoes to body armor, which do not correspond to the features of the female figure. Also, women were not provided with separate underwear or thermos or, for example, feminine hygiene products such as pads or tampons. Therefore, women had to buy uniforms by themselves or to ask the charities in Ukraine to provide them to them. Only last month, women in the Ukrainian army for the first time received sets of summer field suits, which are made taking into account female parameters. And it is expected that until summer, all of the women will receive those uh, summer clothes that feed them, hopefully. (laughs) This is really fascinating. Thank you, Svetlana and Olga. Can I ask you both whether you think that the changing um, attitudes and acceptance of female soldiers has been led primarily by uh, changes in Ukrainian society? Or do you think it's, the, um, it's almost the other way around? It's, it's the more that women do in the army, the more that might change society itself? Or, or is it a bit, bit of a mixture of the both? Who, who's leading on this in your view? Well, I just wanted to, if you allow me to jump first, I just please, wanted please. to add, yeah, thanks, on the uniform, because we also filmed those sets, and you can clearly see that the progress is happening. Let's say when we made the documentary and launched the reports, it was quite painful, and I remember recording the Deputy Minister of Defence and asking her, it was Miss Mala back those days, and... Um, she promised that that uniform would be launched. Now we see that finally they have been given it, but ironically they were given the uniforms, the summer uniforms in winter. So we hope that maybe <laughs> by by summer more of them at least will get the summer uniform. But we understand that the country has to face it in the conditions of war, in the conditions where they don't have enough ammunition. So it's a bit of a mixture of all of those factors you had mentioned. And I mean, obviously, we see that there is a huge push from the society and obviously from women. But also, but also, if you imagine that there is roughly one million soldiers on the front line, right? And most of them, the dramatic most of them are are obviously male soldiers and someone has to do something else. So women had to take a lead in most of other spheres of Ukrainian economy just to keep the country running, really. And uh, But there are still not enough people there because you also know about over 6 million refugees abroad who had to flee Ukraine and millions of refugees internally displaced in the country. So the problem is huge. The manpower is well, the country just lacks the manpower. So women have to join the army as well. And obviously that speeds up the process as well as the crisis reforms happening. From one side, you see the push from the society from speeding up democratic transformations. From the other side, from the other hand, you see you see that there is just necessity. So even if someone doesn't like that, there is no choice really. So women have to join the army because there is not enough manpower. Women have to lead in other industries because there is not enough people simply to do those jobs. And there is quite an interesting phenomenon as well. I mean, obviously, we also see those reports about some people trying to escape the drafts for 
variety of reasons. I'm not here to speak on that topic just now. But also I know some stories which I wanted to bring here about a couple of very young ladies who are, who are just about to enter the university. And I've been hearing more from Ukrainian teenagers, from Ukrainian female teenagers, that they want actually to join the military specialities because they feel that's a way they have to choose because there is a war in the country and if they decide to stay in this country they have to fight for it which is to be honest i have mixed feelings about if if you ask me as a ukrainian and as an international journalist but also a ukrainian someone who was born in ukraine because i obviously i would not want my children to fight but i also understand and appreciate the steps these young people have been doing and the choices they are making because there is really no choice. So it is a choice, but without a choice, if you can put it that way. Absolutely. Um, Svetlana, is that something you're hearing amongst people that you may be speaking to about more women, maybe under 30, either joining and fighting or thinking about joining? What are you hearing? Yes, of course. I have several friends who are aged between 23 to 27. They are women and they volunteered to the army. And one of them is right now in one of the elitist assault brigades in Ukraine. And by the way, she received training in Britain last autumn. And they joined the army because they feel the duty to protect the country. And I know that some of the women I know, they joined the army because, for example, their boyfriends or husbands are fighting too. Or I know also one woman who is like in her, she's 45 years old and her son died in the war. And she felt like it was her obligation to fight right now. And of course, these stories are heartbreaking. And But I, I think the most important realization that came to Ukrainian society is that war has no gender and war doesn't care if you're a man or a woman. And when a rocket hits the house, uh, it kills everyone. It uh, doesn't matter there are children, men, women. And it's the same at the front. If you can be effective and you're a woman, why not protect your country and your people? I just wanted to say thank you to Svetlana for quoting one of the characters from our documentary. It was her brilliant quote of Evgenia, who used to be a sniper and now is back for her rehabilitation and for bringing up her second daughter. And she said, if a rocket targets a house, there is everyone dies, no matter whether you're a man or a woman or a child. So the war doesn't have a gender. Thanks so much, Svetlana, for picking it up. Thank you both very much for your time today. Really fascinating hearing your perspective on this. And it's great that we're covering it as a subject. A question I have is actually the one David asked a moment ago, but it's very well known that in Britain, the impact of the First World War on changing attitudes towards women's roles in society. I don't think it's unfair to say that Ukraine has more traditional uh, attitudes, generally speaking, compared to Britain and many other Western countries uh, with around women and uh, attitudes around motherhood, etc. I wonder if I could hear from both of you, perhaps starting with Olga, on your perspective on how the role of women in the armed forces will change perceptions, change society potentially, and also the, the degree to which it is actually recognised in Ukraine itself. When we were there recently, w- I was watching... Uh, rather bizarrely, I know, watching some Ukrainian soaps on TV. And it was noticeable on that there weren't really much stories that I could see about women in the armed forces. It was all still the men coming home and then dealing with the domestic challenges of that for their loved ones when they came home. So I'm interested also in how widely understood the role of women in the armed forces are in Ukraine. Thanks so much for bringing this question I, I wish it could be translated into Ukrainian and broadcast in Ukrainian television between those soap operas, because <laughs> I believe it's a very important question. And obviously, it's a, still a very sensitive topic. And quite often we see that society is not ready yet, but they don't have time to process it really. So everyone does what they can do. And from what I've been hearing as well to people whom I'm, I'm talking to, and I'm talking to different female soldiers of 
of uh, different age groups. So some of them are in their 50s, some of them are in their 20s. Um, one of them is in has just reached 20 and she has been already a war veteran because she has lost her limb. So you can imagine the spectrum of the problems they've been facing, but obviously the society has a strong force of inertion and it's quite difficult for people to process with that speed um, the role of women. And also there is another topic which is quite not very well studied yet, but which my characters were raising in our documentary, is the impact on their further life. So we have a lot of conversations about post-traumatic stress disorder for the soldiers who come back from the war zone, right? But mostly all those case studies are male. And mostly it is still a woman who is expected to comfort the soldier and to provide her help as much as possible for the rehabilitation. But what would you do if she is actually a soldier, if the woman, the wife or just a mother has that post-traumatic stress disorder and she has to still she is expected to provide comfort for her partner who is also let's say a soldier or who is not a soldier but you know all people living in the war zone are obviously affected in a very dramatic way so that issue is not tackled yet and we believe that we see just a tip of the iceberg because there is not enough data yet it is impossible to have any numbers any statistics but that's something which female soldiers have been sharing with me and obviously the issue of the sexual harassment as well emotional harassment is this still there it is uncomparably less or less visible than it used to be but it does exist and Obviously, women don't want to speak about it because it's a very sensitive issue. And all, obviously, they want to focus on defending their country. But it takes a lot of efforts for, I think, all participants of that process to actually keep it going. And I believe if we raise these questions on the international level, it, it is quite, it is really helpful. And it is something which helps to move this discussion forward. I completely agree with Olga about the emotional harassment. Ukraine is still uh, a bit conservative country and women are viewed here as mothers who have to sit at home, take care of the children, give birth to babies to give more Ukrainians, Ukrainian men who then can grow up and fight in the war. And of course, many women don't see themselves like that and have they have proven that they could help countries war effort from starting from being volunteers and supplying food and clothes and drones to soldiers, working in the defense companies that produce weapons for the army and also being on the front line fight, fighting is equal with the men. The women I talked to, they say that they are not. They are often not viewed equal to men who are soldiers until they they prove that they are capable of doing something, something inspiring or like to be to make a difficult job. For example, being a sniper, and only then they earn their respect. And I think it should be from the beginning. And also, uh, women should know what their future will be and what part they will have in the army after the war ends and also about their professional growing what position they can take because uh, I'm not I guess we don't have a woman who is a general in Ukraine and so are, are they able at all to have this position in the future because of course they they need to, to have place to grow I just wanted to mention that I filmed a female commander, which uh, we think is quite a victory for the Ukrainian armed forces and clearly shows the progress. And she joined the armed forces as a sniper. She's currently uh, in the middle of the battlefield. I can't say exactly where because of the sensitivity of her location, but we are in touch. And she, while joining as a sniper, she managed to get her authority and to become a commander of all male units and yeah but i think it's quite a rare occasion at least 
I haven't managed to find many cases like that. But her case shows that it is possible, there are changes. And she also said quite an interesting thing when I asked her whether she thought that female leadership in the armed forces is different from the male leadership and does the army actually benefit from it or does it is it something like a minus? And she said that what she noticed is that the atmosphere in her unit was more you can't say really more positive because you understand the environment they are dealing with. But she said that it was more and people felt more responsibility and they also felt that she would not give them a task just to test their bravery. So she was always thinking about how many lives she can save in while playing in her tactics. So the soldiers under her commandment acknowledged better planning skills of their commander and also less losses. Less losses. But obviously, I can't extrapolate it as the credible statistics on all the armed forces because it's one of the cases and there is no reliable data yet because of the sensitivity of the topic and of the numbers. Olga, when I was down in um, Kramatorsk last summer, the commander of the unit uh, that the volunteers were delivering aid to was was, was a woman as well. I, I didn't notice any I know, disrespect or, or anything towards her. It all felt comple- it all felt very normal, which was which I, I sort of didn't remark too much upon on, on the time. But now now we're talking about this has, has really come back to me. Can I ask just a couple of questions before we go to Dom? Because I know Dom has got one as well. You mentioned both of you the sort of some of the ages of the of the women volunteering and fighting. Do we have any other sense? Is there any other data of the kind of background backgrounds uh, these women come from are they uh, are there any patterns we should know about is it, is it primarily working class people maybe rich people from the cities or from the maybe from the villages do we know anything about that or is that at the moment uh, unstudied and a final question for me would be quite a sad one really what do we know of those female soldiers who've been taken prisoner do we know much about their conditions and what have we heard about what's happening to them in terms of the female prisoners obviously the risks there are much higher because even what we explode and uh, explodes in our documentary is that female soldiers are at higher risk because there is all the disinformation campaign about them and the huge campaign on dehumanization so if male soldiers are being perceived by the Russian army as, well, with more or less respect, if the word respect could be applied to those conditions. But at least there is some kind of respect that they are soldiers and these that side is the soldiers. Then for female soldiers, it's a very different attitude and they're being dehumanized dramatically and all horrible sexist approach apply there. I don't want to verbalize it there because obviously... It, it will not fit any values we follow. And I just don't want to provide a platform for those horrible claims. But if you want to dive into it, you can watch our documentary, Ukraine Women at War, the BBC iPlayer, and there is more on that. And um, in terms of the class, I think it's worth to mention that Ukrainian society has a bit of a different structure from the British society. And the class system is not that obvious there. So... Obviously, there is a gap in terms of professions and salaries people get, but the social lifts are much more flexible, I would say. So someone from a village who has good potential, who likes to study, could reach very high top state positions just because of their efforts. Obviously, there is corruption and all of these still exists, unfortunately, it is becoming less, but the social lifts do work and you don't have to be from a very rich family to be successful in the government or in any other sector, especially if it is startup sector or any really any profession, even very creative profession. And uh, speaking about that, taking that into consideration, you can also imagine that obviously there is no gap in terms of, there is no really class definition in terms of when you speak about those people who joined the army and especially women. So the first wave was mostly people, volunteers, mostly, I would say, people more social, social, more active in terms of the social activities. And those were journalists, probably, social activists, people who just have a very strong feeling of injustice and they just couldn't watch it really. So I would say that the first wave would be more from the intellectual professions. 
then there were people really helping and understanding that, well, there is that saying in Ukraine now that at some point everyone will have to fight, which is really painful for me to follow. And I, I want to believe that it will never happen and this war will stop as soon as possible, obviously. But that's the saying which exists in Ukrainian society and I've been hearing it quite often. And uh, But still we see that uh, quite often those are people from the... Uh, I would say highly intellectual, or those who were in social care, those who had businesses. Let's say one of the snipers I filmed, she used to be a businesswoman. She used to have her jewelry business. Her name is Evgenia. And she didn't have to go to the army. Obviously, she would never be drafted. And But she decided that she, she just couldn't tolerate it because she was socially active and she couldn't tolerate injustice and she felt she could do something better than others so she joined and we've been hearing lots of such stories obviously women have a bit more choice here because there is no obligatory draft for ukrainian women in the army while men have very strict requirement to stay in the country and they are all eligible to be drafted when they are while they are from 18 to 60 years old women can be eligible but if she doesn't want to join, the law says that she will not be joined. So that's how it is now. If it is, I hope I responded at least a bit of your question. No, absolutely. That was really fascinating. Thank you, Olga. Svetlana, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, I would like to add also about the military education for women, because before the full-scale invasion, for example, only in 2019, women were allowed to enter the military institution. For example, the Lyceum of uh, Ivan Bohun in Kiev is uh, like military college. And just in 2019, for the first time, 20 w- women were accepted there. And of course, right now, all of our soldiers, doesn't matter of their gender, they have uh, like from two to three months of military training and women receive it too. But it's also about thinking how in the future, uh, Ukrainian women who want to become service women, be in the army, how they can receive education and enter all this university that men can enter in Ukraine right now. Hi, Olga Svetlana, it's Dom here. Thanks so much for for joining us today. Just one question for me, if I may. I remember in the British Army experience or British societal experience, a load of buffy old war horses who would always say that the military was no place for women. They used to use arguments like saying, well, women have to too calming an effect on the soldiers around them they won't want to fight because they'll be they'll all be looking after the women etc etc they also use use the argument about the front line and i know it is it is more obvious in in the war in ukraine but actually the concept of the front line is largely irrelevant these days because missiles can go anywhere so this idea that women shouldn't be on the front line it just makes them it is made a mockery of and yet you still see little little pools of these uh of these old sort of misogynistic attitudes around now in the in the british experience we did take decades to to come to the conclusion that actually in terms of sort of musculoskeletal injury and the load bearing that a woman is expected or that all soldiers are expected to put up with and the, the, a, a female frame is, is in many cases different from a man's and therefore the kit has to be different it took us years to start building body armor that was that was more applicable to the female form i mean are you seeing these arguments being burnt through quicker in Ukraine with the experience you've had for the last 10 years and the last two years in particular or are they still are they still trotted out either by those who don't know any better or those who are just just out of time? Thanks. Well, I would say that definitely the war speeded up the processes and all women I've been speaking to who have joined the front line, they would never do so if the war didn't come to their home. So for them, As I said before, it is a choice without a choice, really. I mean, obviously, you can always hide or pretend it doesn't happen. But, you know, all people are different. So everyone just wants to contribute the way they can. So those women thought that's the best way they can contribute. And I totally agree with with the thoughts you voiced. It is quite a painful topic. And from what I've been seeing as well, I mean, obviously I grew up in Kiev and I had lots of, I saw lots of people who were employed in the army, let's put it that way. And it was possible for a woman to be a military interpreter, to be a 
military lawyer to be, I don't know, to serve even in the police forces. But it was not common because Ukrainians, how to put it, probably they are still a tra traditional society. And in that looks, men still do feel quite protective about women. It, it has its flip side, and we have discussed it before, but it is still something which happens, and that's how most of men feel in the army, even if they, well, most of them, who, most of those who I've been speaking to, they said that obviously they would not want to see women being injured or being killed, and they would prefer to protect them and to keep them at home looking for I don't know, allowing them to do more peaceful jobs. But as you mentioned correctly, there is no really safe place in Ukraine. And we've been seeing there a phenomenon really where people just realized that they can't really, even if they stay in the homes in, and pretend that there is, they are trying to do some kind of peaceful jobs, they will still have to be involved in the military activities. They will still have to protect themselves. So more women started to think about military training to be able to protect themselves first. And let's say I've been talking to some women who did not join the army when Russia first invaded in 2014. And they thought that army is too much for them, that obviously it's very scary. They didn't want to go to the front line. They thought that it is they would be able to contribute some kind of some other way and to help those who are protecting them. But then their settlements were occupied by the Russian forces. And one of those women, she was raped. She was raped badly. And if we can even say so. And luckily, she stayed alive. And it takes, she has been still recovering from that. But when she realized that she was alive and when she was liberated, she said the first thing she did is that she enrolled to the military training and to the armed forces because she said, at least I would be able to protect myself. At least I would be able to have arms and uh, know how to operate them and have slightly slimmer chances to survive and to protect her family. I would like to add a bit another side of this story. I heard some voices from a Ukrainian men who were forcibly conscripted to the army and they feel that there is a place for injustice and they are like, why uh, Ukrainian women are not conscripted equally as men? Why are they allowed to go abroad and men are not allowed? But I don't think that the Ukrainian government is going to make any changes to that because when Russian forces uh, advance and they occupy a village or a town, usually men, the families, they have their men fighting and the only person who can rescue the children is a woman who grabs them and brings them to the western uh, part of Ukraine or abroad. So I, I, I don't think it's going to happen, but I heard a lot of men talking that as Ukraine, the Ukrainian army badly needs a lot of people and the tighter conscription rule, rules are underway right now. And they're wondering why a Ukrainian government doesn't make it obligatory for some women. For example, recently there were talks that women who have a medical education has to be, have to be conscripted too, but it hasn't been decided yet. Well, thank you very much, Svetlana and Olga, for your time and your thoughts today. Let's move um, to our final thoughts then. Francis Sternley, would you like to go first? Thanks, David. A really interesting conversation today. I just want to thank Phoebe Page from the Ukrainian Institute for her assistance in making sure today was possible and also for the materials that we're going to add into the description for today's episode for anyone who's interested in these subjects. For my final thought, though, I just want to raise a video that we've done here at The Telegraph. This month, of course, Putin will, in the loosest possible sense, face an election and the result isn't in doubt. But questions need to be asked, I think, about how secure Putin is. Is he as secure as he appears? Just how strong can any dictator be, especially one waging a war that has sent hundreds of thousands of one citizens to their deaths? It's also worth remembering, too, as we've discussed on the podcast in the past, that Putin is not a young man at 71 years old. He already exceeds the average age of a Russian male. 
imagine for a moment if he were suddenly taken unwell or obliged to hand over power due to ill health over the coming months or years, what then? And as such, it is worth our contemplating who's waiting in the wings should such a um, scenario occur just as the Western intelligence agencies do, which is why we've released this new video looking at the possible successes and challenges that Putin might one day face. Many of the names will be unfamiliar to listeners, so I recommend checking it out. The video is titled Russian Election 2024, Who is Left to Challenge Putin's Grip? It's on YouTube and we'll also add a link in the description. Very keen to hear listeners' perspectives on this one. Thank you so much, Francis. Dom Nichols. Well, thanks, David. So this week we've heard a lot of very good words from international leaders, some good deeds. Uh, UK, we've heard Defence Secretary Shapps, Foreign Secretary Cameron, notably little from the Prime Minister, I would say. But we've also had a lot of good words from France, Poland, the EU. I note Mrs von der Leyen is out campaigning in Romania, campaigning for her second, for the second term as European Council President. So a lot of good words. Pretty much everyone was was happy with Sweden's accession to NATO this week. Although, note for the trolls, please tell me how that is yet another example of nasty old NATO gobbling up another unwilling state. But a lot of goodwill, a lot of good words. And I just, I just, a theme I've been talking about for some days, actually. There's got to be first mover advantage here for a politician. If they all mean what they say and they have every intention of moving, as in supporting Ukraine to win, whatever it takes, but are all looking over their shoulders to see who's going to go first. There has to be a political first mover advantage. There's been lots of talk about Europe's political centre of gravity shifting to the north and to the east, and that might put noses out of joint in London, Paris and Berlin. That might in turn make them act. But there's a, there's a, lot, of, there's a lot of talk and a lot of people looking around for who's going to who's going to jump first and there has to be politicians love being in the lead but no one's actually really gone for it yet and i just wonder david who is going to reach for the prize because now surely is the time to do it thank you very much dom and francis olga shall we come to you next yes it's tricky to comment what's happening next really we just as a journalist as journalists we just have to wait and follow really and i would like really to emphasize on that topic as we are speaking today about women in the armed forces and i just wanted to say that to to second really the thought svetlana mentioned here that there is a lot of conversation in the society whether it should um, be made obligatory for women as well it is as well as it is made for men now. But obviously that subject is very painful for the Ukrainian society. And I just wanted to emphasize that, back to your question, that Ukraine has a citizen army. And if that conversation would be handled about the army in the country which is in peace, which is not fighting for its survival, it would be a different army and a different conversation. But they have to make those decisions in the conditions of surviving. That's why probably those decisions are really different from what we can see in the democracies which don't have to fight for their survival. Thank you so much, Olga. Svetlana, would you like the very final words? Yes, I just think I would like to thank the all the women who bravely volunteered and who serve right now in the Ukrainian army and fight for our freedom and for the peace in Ukraine. And I think as journalists, our task is keep reporting on them and making sure that they have all what they need. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, a world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine The Latest as soon as it is released, 
do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine The Latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Charles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.